Hi there, this is Phil Gursky of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting in Ottawa, Canada, and you're listening to An Intelligent Look at Terrorism, which is a podcast about, surprise, surprise, terrorism. There's been one theme in largely Western countries over the past four to five years that's getting a lot of attention. And this this phenomenon is what do we do with those uh, who are citizens of our countries who have elected uh, unwisely, as it se- as it turns out, to leave what they have here in Canada, United States, Western Europe, etc., and join a terrorist group. We call these people foreign fighters, or sometimes foreign terrorist fighters, or FTFs. Some of these people who join groups like ISIS, Al Shabaab, Al Qaeda, etc., uh, do us a favor and get killed. Either get killed in operations or attacks against civilians, which is a bad thing, or through drone strikes or other military action. Some are still active and they are a problem going forward because they are still terrorists and could carry out mayhem. It's the third group that is causing a lot of consternation in Western audiences and that's what to do with those who've been captured and some of whom are sit languishing in camps. Some have been tried by courts in countries like Iraq and Syria. They have been found guilty, uh, sentenced and executed. But it's the ones that are still kind of in limbo that we're asking questions about. The debate that becomes, what do we do with them? They are Canadians or Americans or Brits or Germans. And there's some parts of our society who say we should bring them home because they're ours. Others say we should leave them there and leave them to their own fate where they chose to become terrorists. To help me unpack this situation, I'm really pleased to have on the podcast today, David Mallet, who is a professor in Justice, Law and Criminology at the School of Public Affairs at American University in Washington. And like me, David's actually written a book on foreign fighters. He's been looking at the problem since 2005. His his book, uh, Foreign Fighters, Transnational Identity in Civil Conflicts, came out in 2013, three years before my book on foreign fighters came out. So David, um, I'm pleased to punch you here to help me understand the, the phenomenon of foreign fighters. Thanks, Phil. It's really good to talk to you. Let's start with an easy question for you, David. What is it about terrorism that, that, that captured your interest in the first place as an academic? Yeah, I, I suppose I had a winding route into it. Um, I started out just undergraduate in college as an international relations major. And, you know, I wasn't an, I wasn't an economics guy or a language guy, I guess. Uh, so probably I became security studies by default. And I wanted to work in government you know, in, in the States. Um, so I ended up moving to Washington uh, for my master's degree in national security studies back in, in 1998, trying to figure out what would be you know, the next big thing at, at this time when so much was in transition internationally. Um, and I took a class called, at the time, called Trans-State Security, which today we would call transnational security, I suppose, that focused on a lot of, of non-state actors, uh, you know, more non-traditional security issues like pandemics that we're seeing today. And for my research, I suppose, in that course, um, you know, at the time, looking at non-state actors, I was really interested in what was happening in Israel with with, with Hamas and their suicide bombing campaign. So in other words, terrorists. Yeah, right. Uh, I was, it was so contrary to everything I had been taught as an international relations student that, that states are what matter, that every actor out there was looking out for their interests, and that means survival first. You know, that, and, and here are people who are not acting for material interests, who are not trying to survive, but they were having a big effect on Israeli society. They swung the 1996 uh, Israeli elections. And I thought, wow, if, if that was effective in Israel, that tactic is going to be exported elsewhere. It's going to come to North America, and I, I should probably learn about this. Um, and actually, when I had my oral defense at the end of my master's program, this was the end of 1999, uh, and they said, all right, what, what have you learned, basically? And I said, I think the next big thing, the, the big thing we're all going to be worrying about for the next decade is suicide attacks by religious terrorist groups. And, you know, they didn't exactly throw me out of the room, but, but it was clear that they were pretty <laughs> unimpressed. That I, I, like, what, what the heck are you talking about? That's not what you were supposed to learn here. Um, <laughs> took, took a couple of weeks to hear that I'd passed. And... After that, I went to work for a few years. I wanted to go back and do a PhD, but I went to work on, on Capitol Hill working for uh, most of the time I was there for for uh, Tom Daschle, who was a, a U.S. Senator, yes. mm-hmm. uh, Democratic Party leader in the Senate at the time. And, you know, I was in the office in 2001 during 9-11. Uh, a month later, it was our office that got the anthrax mailing. So I ended up as a precaution oh, on Cipro for 100 right, years. That's right. Yeah. I remember yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> so I got, I got a little bit closer to all of this than I was expecting. Um, 
but it, it showed me clearly, yeah, this, this is relevant. And I went back for the, the PhD and, you know, by the time I did that, all these, these really obscure topics that I'd been studying, about suicide, religious terrorism, and I actually had done some research on, on bioterrorism and things like that. The, the things I wanted to specialize in 1999, you know, by, by 2003, everybody was an expert on them. Mm -hmm. So I ended up having to think about, all right, what's, what's the next, next big thing that I can do for my doctoral dissertation? And that led me to the foreign fighters. It's interesting you say that, David, because that's one thing that, that I've noted is that, you know, as someone who is probably, you know, eight times older than you are, um, <laughs> my career in intelligence began, you know, while the Cold War was still raging. And, you know, terrorism was just, it was a sidebar for, for most of the lifespan of most intelligence agencies, certainly prior to 9-11. It was all about the Soviet Union. It was all about the Warsaw Pact. It was all about, you know, mutually assured destruction, all, all things like that. And then 9-11 happened, and you're right. Uh, for a lot of people, this was sort of a turning point. I, I often say we live in a post-9-11 era whereby everybody wanted to jump on the bandwagon and, and, and look at terrorism, study, study terrorism. And I'm not dismissing, you know, your decision to do that, but it's interesting how we went from what was truly a niche field where, you know, this is the Brian Jenkins and Bruce Hoffmans and, and Martha Crenshaws of this world, David Rappaport. All of a sudden now, everybody wants to look at terrorism and um you know, that's neither here nor here nor there. There's some good scholars, there's some terrible scholars, there's some good analysts and some terrible analysts. So, you, you know, you you decided this was an interesting thing, uh, obviously because of 9-11, what happened um, in Tom Daschle's office with the, with the bioterror incident. What was it specifically about foreign fighters, though, that led you to focus on that? And you've been doing this for the better part of two decades now. Yeah, so this was around, I don't know, 2004, 2005. Uh, I was trying to come up with my dissertation topic to, to do a few years of research on. And I, I still wanted to do something that was an emerging security issue that was policy relevant. And I was also interested in the time uh, in, in systems theory and, and network analysis. This was, you know, 2004 was the year Facebook was created, right? I was, I was just doing some background reading uh, before social media. Uh, and I'd been taking, again, these international relations classes that were talking about the international system all the time and, and just reading about systems through like, no, this isn't how systems work. They're, systems are networks. You know, your people are connected with each other. Uh, they don't balance against each other the way, the way they talk about states balancing power. They, they connect. And the more connected ones are the most effective actors. And in, around this time, 2004, 2005, the occupation of Iraq uh, was not going very well, right? You're, you're getting insurgents uh, stepping up their attacks, and you're also getting insurgents showing up from other countries. And still and isn't thought, going well 20 years later, by the way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we're, we're still working on those lessons. Maybe I, maybe I studied the wrong stuff. Um, but I, you know, I thought this is really interesting. Why would you go be an insurgent in somebody else's civil war? Mm -hmm. It's clearly not about citizenship. It's, it's about something else. I wonder if I can apply... You know, social network analysis, some some of the systems theory stuff to explain, you know, better why people go fight in somebody else's insurgent group. And I started looking for the literature on why do people go fight in somebody else's insurgent group. And at the time, I couldn't find any. There, there wasn't even mm -hmm. a name for it. Right. Uh, I started working on transnational insurgents. Nobody knew what I was talking about. And I, I didn't really like the term foreign fighters. It was too Fox News for me. But But people... Mm -hmm knew what I was talking about. So uh, I started working on it from there. It, it's interesting you say that because I know that when I wrote my book in, in 2015, after my first book on um, that, that I wrote on radicalization, I too struggled to find any kind of literature. And I, I was, I expanded even more, more widely to look at just mercenaries. And I even went back to, you know, Canadians who fought in the Boer War in the late 19th century and what were the motivations for them doing so to try to understand well, you know, if there's any possible crossover of motivations for those that join terrorist groups. So once you started your study, David, and you, I say you've been at this for quite some time now, what are the, 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 you know, the, the, the top couple of things that you've learned about why people do this? I'm, I'm so glad you, you're talking about networks. And you know, I don't do social network analysis because I'm not an academic, I'm a practitioner, but I couldn't agree with you more. It's all about who you know and how you know them because people just don't get on a plane tomorrow and go to Somalia, or go to Afghanistan, or go to, go to you know, or go to Idlib. Uh, it, it, it's about who you know and how how you can get there. So, what are the grand lessons that you can you can pick up? I know this is an unfair question to, to summarize twenty years worth of research in a podcast, but for my listeners' uh, benefit, what are the big things you've learned about about these these foreign terrorist fighters? Yeah, there actually, I think, are a few big patterns that, that we can see uh, emerging, and I'll, I'll circle back in a minute to the question of who you know, because I think that is critically important stopping foreign fighters. We, we've seen it happen already, and it should be applied more widely. 
so when I was doing this doctoral work, uh, you know, I wasn't going to Afghanistan. And, you know, I wasn't going to Iraq. Uh, it, it, there was no way I could do field work at the time. I, I knew people who said, oh, yeah, we're going to get you into Guantanamo. You can do interviews. That, that never happened. And my university would never have allowed me to use that data anyway. So it's well, I can imagine important. that would be problematic for an academic <laughs> yeah, you, you shift to Guantanamo. We, we got in shit over it over somebody, a Canadian, and, and that, that Canadian is now $10.5 million richer because the, the courts ruled that, uh, or the government decided we had violated his rights. But anyhow, that's a whole other story. Yeah, well, I, I don't think I would have ended up <laughs> 10 million richer. I probably would have ended up a whole lot poorer in that case. Um, yeah, so what I ended up ha having to say, all right, where can I get information from? I'm going to look at other cases of... of people becoming something that looks like foreign fighters, you know, people going off to fight in the Spanish civil war was, it was a famous example that was always mm -hmm. used as, as a comparison point. Yes. And there were, you know, um, I will point out, I, I grew up in LA, but my dad's family's from Toronto. There were, you know, several hundred Canadians in, in the McKinsey Papineau battalion. Right, Absolutely. It, I, if I may interrupt, I have a whole section on that. There's, there's actually a memorial in downtown Ottawa to the volunteers who fought in the Spanish civil war. No one knows about it, but it has all the names of the Canadians that fought uh, for the, uh, you know, for the for the nationalists, uh, sorry, for the Republicans uh, against Franco's army. It's a fascinating part of Canadian history. Wow, I'm gonna have to check that out the next time I'm there. I did not know that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I ended up looking at that, but I ended up, you know, just doing deeper research, like how many cases are out there, how how many can we find and draw conclusions from. And it turned out that, you know, we, despite the fact we were really worried at the time about Al Qaeda, this was before ISIS, you know. Um, jihadis, that foreign fighters were not new. And it wasn't just the Spanish Civil War, that they were actually really surprisingly common and that you could take some of the, the data out there about civil wars and insurgencies going back to Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And you could find that you know rebel groups in about a quarter of civil wars in the last couple hundred years have recruited outside volunteers. So it's not just jihadis. You know, it's ideological groups like, like you know, the like you're mentioning, the International brigades in the Spanish Civil War, uh, people who were you know, ideologically communist or actually fascist as well. On the other side, there, there were ethnic groups, right? Diaspora Jews in the Israeli War of Independence or mm -hmm. Albanians who fought in the Atlantic brigades in Kosovo uh, who came from, from North America, from Germany and elsewhere. And, you know, what the interesting thing to me is I was just going to do a compare and contrast. How, how are all these different groups doing it differently? And, and the real big surprise for me was they weren't. Uh, that what we see the jihadis doing is what every one of these groups do. They play on identity. They, they find people who are generally, but not always, you know, marginalized within the society they're living in. And they say, forget your citizenship. You're part of you know, this group, religious, ethnic, ideological, and your people are under this existential threat. Mm -hmm. And it, it's your duty. Your government's not doing anything. It's your duty to go do something. You'll be a hero. You'll give meaning to your life. They employ a lot of really gendered language about you know saving women and children. They invent atrocities if they're, if they're not happening. They they focus on martyrdom. Uh, even you know communists, atheists were being told to to sacrifice themselves for the cause. Or Christians were being told, well, it'll help you in the afterlife if you fall in defense of Christ. Wow. Um, I, I have a couple when I show PowerPoint presentations. I have a couple of posters that I like to show. You know, one recruiting jihadis to Bosnia. From the 90s and another one from back in the 1830s recruiting anglo-saxons to go fight in the texas revolution you know at the alamo and you've they got use, to be kidding you're, you're making almost, this up <laughs> they use almost I'll, I'll send you the graphics phil they use almost <laughs> identical arguments in the exact same order oh my like how God. they're coming for us they're coming for the women you have to do something little nod nod wink wink at the bottom about how you can get involved if you want to help out uh it's, it's really amazing to me wow that's and, fascinating and the way returnees have behaved over the years, over the centuries, too, for all these different causes has been pretty consistent. There's always a handful of guys who stay mobilized, who stay engaged and go on to do other things. But they're handfuls. Mm -hmm. Right. So these patterns, you know, assuming that these these analogies hold up, that these cases are pretty consistent, then we have potentially hundreds of thousands of data points, not just thousands for the jihadis, but we have we have decades or even centuries of data that we can examine. And I think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn. And part of that in involves, you know, playing on these identity ties that get people mobilized first, right? This, this idea that, you know, you and I will see appeals to, to help people in trouble all over the world all the time, right? Um, but we don't feel like we have to pick up a gun and go do mm -hmm. something about it ourselves. Right. So, yeah, but the sense that, that this is your fight, 
is the message that I think always comes up. And if you give people alternatives, if you make them think about, well, no, you, you are a citizen. No, you do have other obligations. No, this is not incumbent upon you to do something, which seems to be the main message that recruiters use for foreign fighters or foreign terrorist fighters. I think that's the way to go. What we've seen with ISIS volunteers, and actually what I can show you was the case with you know diaspora Jews being recruited to go fight in the Israeli War of Independence too, is what's effective in stopping people from going? The most effective thing is an appeal from their mother. And recruiters always try to keep people isolated from their families, just, just I suppose like any group that's radicalizing or indoctrinating people, gangs, cults, right? You keep them away from their families. But, you know, it's not because we, we worry a lot in, when we talk about uh, CVE, PVE, about yeah. narratives, right? Yeah. Oh, we have to have a better narrative than, than ISIS or Al-Qaeda. And I don't think it's because, you know, mom has a better narrative. It's because she is able to go or dad is able to go and say, hey, you know, this, this imagined community you're part of, that is really important, but what about your real family? You have obligations mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. You know, it, and it's not the narrative. It's, it is who you know in that sense, too. That's a really interesting finding. I know that the jihadis have made, and I'm sure you're aware of this, a lot of jihadis talk about things like Fard Ain and Fard Kifaya, you know, this individual obligation versus a collective obligation, saying that you as a, as a, a true believing Muslim, you have no choice but to help your fellow brothers and sisters, as you just pointed out earlier, David, who are being up, you know, uh, uh, they're being um, oppressed or they're being occupied or they're being beaten or they're being killed. And it, it is incumbent upon you as an individual to take up the mantle, take up your sword and travel, irrespective of what anybody else tells you, is that y your identity as a Muslim sort of supersedes your identity as an American or a Canadian or as a father or as a brother or as a sister, or whatever. So they're appealing to that very, very, I'd, I'd say, sort of fundamental notion of what it means to be you and your identity. So that's what these people are, are basically, they're, they're trying to get, get their hooks into you that way, right? Yeah, I, I think so. But of course, we all have different identities, right? We all have exactly. not all just one thing. So what these you know recruiters with the, the, the radicalization efforts are successful in doing is making that one particular identity the most salient and saying you have duties to that that supersede everything else. Let's okay. So let's move on a little bit. You did spend some time in in Australia. You were teaching at the University of Melbourne. Um, can you did you spend enough time in Australia to get a sense as to how the Aussies are looking at this problem versus how we in North America are looking at it? Yeah, I I had a well, it was to me interesting. I had some interesting insights from that uh, because I actually was I was there for four years. I was planning to be there longer. I uh, actually got. It was, it's not so permanent in Australia if you don't stay there, but got got permanent residency. Um, so I was really going through the the integration process, I suppose, of, of moving to Australia. Um, also had a, a chance to work with a lot of great practitioners as well as scholars there. And it was actually really interesting timing because this was right when ISIS was picking up. Exactly. So, so you know, my experience there um, on the personal side was that I moved there in 2012. And I'm this, you know, this blondish, blue-eyed American professor who, who the government has paid to move out there, you know, basically through the education system. And it, integrating there was incredibly difficult. Um, they don't use the term immigrant, they're even migrant, even, even if you're moving there. And I couldn't get a smartphone from the, telecom, the main telecom company there because I was told, well, you're a migrant and migrants are associated with terrorism. We don't give them smartphones because they can plan things. This is 2012. Uh, the main bank I was trying, I was working with there wouldn't give me a credit card because they, you know, they said, uh, you know, we, we don't use credit cards in Australia, which is manifestly not true. But but here's a brochure that might help you out and explain to me how to be an Australian by, by telling me about concepts like democracy and barbecues. Are you and, serious? And like Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, it was really, it was really hard for several months. Just you know, even to be able to find a place to live without good internet access that, that I couldn't get, and you know, couldn't get a smartphone, couldn't, couldn't get local credit cards. Um, and I began to think about, wow, if if you know, if I didn't have resources to take care of myself, I would have to rely on whoever would help me. And you know, my kids, yeah, I knew they they would be the foreign kids. My daughter uh, was you know always the American kid, even though there were other foreign kids there. She was sort of singled out in school, got really resentful about it and dived into learning American history in a way that I'm pretty sure she wouldn't have had, had we stayed in the States. And I just thought, you know, she's not some jingoistic flag waving USA, USA type, but she knows more about, you know, American history than I ever will. 
the way she embraced that identity. And I thought, wow, if she had been, let's say, a, a boy from Pakistan, this could have turned out in a very different direction, the way she's responding to the stimulus. So just just my four years in Australia, actually, from a personal level in, in approaching this research, were kind of eye-opening and seeing what can happen to immigrants or people who are marginalized and not being able to be part of the national society, why they might see themselves as more part of a, a, an outside group, why they might be more liable to become you know, foreign fighters. And it also gave me a sense, a lesson we might, I think, could probably learn everywhere of, of the role of the private sector, right, of, of telecom companies and banks in, in making life harder or easier for people. And I don't think we pay enough attention to public-private partnerships in, when it comes to CVE and PVE. Um, I spent so yeah. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I, I spent quite a bit of time in Australia, not surprisingly, as a member of the Five Eyes, and um, I, I did get a chance to meet people in the Australian government who were doing CVE, so countering violent extremism. For those who don't recognize the acronym, and I did find that they, you know, in the mid 2000s, they they were start, started to sort of look at this kind of seriously. But on the other hand, the Australian government has been rather harsh when it comes to what to do with Australians who have left to join ISIS or Hizbut Tahrir or, or sorry, um, the, um, the, you know, HTS uh, groups like Hayat al-Shams and groups like that. It's almost like, you know, kind of screw you. Uh, we gave you everything. You've rejected us. We don't give a damn what happens to you. Is that the sense you got from Australia when you, yeah, were, when you were there? Uh, that, was, that was totally my sense. Um, you know, the, the timing of moving there was really interesting because, you know, this was obviously when Syria was heating up when just as ISIS was starting and people don't always believe this, but Australia had a really huge foreign fighter problem right when I got there, 2013. Yes. Um, they were number one per capita for a while, at least in the Western world. And so they were hugely concerned about this. So I, it, it did give me, at least in that sense, uh, maybe, maybe, you know, the, the phone store wasn't going to help me out, but I got the chance to do work with uh, government and law enforcement. The federal government there, I don't think, was uh, was a big fan of my, my positions about foreign fighter recruitment and, and, and returnees, but I did a lot of work at, at the, you know, the state level in Victoria. I had a chance to work with law enforcement there. So I guess the, the big, you know, focuses of Australian counterterrorism at the time, certainly, they were, they were really focused on uh, people going off to Syria, understandably. Uh, you know, I, it was, I, I had the, an invitation once out to Abu Dhabi, and I was stopped in the airport because I was leaving Australia to go to, to the Middle East on a third country passport. Uh, so they, they were definitely putting that, you know, in, in, into effect, right? Those, those kind of restrictions. I suppose the rest of the time, their, their main focus outside the country's borders is almost exclusively on in Indonesia, which which makes sense. It's a neighboring country, much bigger population, but most of the, the specialized expertise there is on Indonesia and not on any groups beyond Indonesia, which I, th I think is something that if you're an Australian um, academic or researcher or practitioner, that, that's something to look at. Um, but when it comes to domestic radicalization, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. There was a sense that it was migrants, I suppose, like, like myself at the time who were uh, aggrieved, you know, who, you know, needed to be talked to by, by the right person, I suppose, to, to calm down and learn lessons. Uh, there were no, not like Europe, there weren't national, you know, counter radicalization or PVE programs. Um, it was a little bit, you know, I suppose like North America in that sense, a lot of it was just contracted out by, by different government agencies to, Local groups, I remember one set of discussions I kept hearing there was how a lot of the resources were going to local imams who you know, didn't really speak English and weren't capturing the attention of some of the young people who were being radicalized by, by more smooth you know, ISIS types. So you know, did they really know what they were throwing their money after? Was there any evidence that any of these programs were even working? There wasn't a centralized research branch. So there was nothing like, like the Kanishka Project. Right. You know, in Canada, uh, in, in Australia, where, where the research was being centralized, it was just being sort of funded piecemeal by different agencies. So there's definitely, um, I think from the Australian side, if it were up to me, I, I would see more of a, uh, a best practices learned, you know, attempt to, to talk to other people. Mm -hmm. So let's now turn, David, to the $64,000 question, or maybe updating myself, maybe it's the $64 million question in 2020. <laughs> In your having looked at foreign fighters, having studied it um, for, for for quite some time now, what do you think about this issue about the big debate going on in the Western world? It's going on in your country. It's going on in my country. It's going on throughout Western Europe. Should in fact our governments repatriate citizens of our nations 
who are being held, uh, as I said earlier in my introduction, some are in refugee camps, some are in prison, some are in holding cells, etc. What is the responsibility from your perspective of Western governments when it comes to what to do with their citizens who went to join groups like ISIS, etc.? So from my perspective, it's a question of dealing with the least worst outcome. Um, if I were, if I know if I were working in government, it would be very hard. These days, it would be very hard for me to say, yeah, yeah, take somebody back and, and, and let's try to reintegrate them in your community. Uh, good, you know, good luck with that politically. But looking at things, I've, I've done a couple of studies in the last couple of years about returnees and also about those who don't return. And so when it comes to weighing risk and, and what is likely to be the biggest threat, I come down on the side of uh, people need to be brought back home and prosecuted, surveilled as needed. Um, that there also might be some benefits to returnees. So historically speaking, I said, you know, whether it's the jihadis in the past or groups before them, you don't see, when, when people are left alone, they tend to just reintegrate and go back to their day jobs. And that's actually been, for me, the main difference with the jihadis as compared to past foreign fighters. Why are they still out there? Are they really more radical or extreme than other people who've gone off, you know, people who are working for the Soviet Union as communist agents or, or what have you? Um, to me, the big difference has been that since the 1980s, starting with Arab states and that go, people going to Afghanistan, is that governments did not allow people to reintegrate. They, they prosecuted them. They made it clear that they couldn't come home. And it caused them to just go elsewhere. It caused them to take their experiences learned and join other armed groups from Afghanistan to Bosnia, the Philippines, and, and places like that. Uh, to me, from this time period, you know, to me, Osama bin Laden is exhibit A of what happens when you say, no, you can't come home and, you know, we're, we're shutting the door and then the, the government just washes its hands of one of its mm -hmm. citizens. They don't just disappear. So, you know, maybe, as you said before, maybe you're lucky and some of them get killed. But what happens to the ones who don't? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, was, I did a report that came out a few months ago uh, with uh, Janine de Roy Van and Chelsea Damon, who are a couple of yes. uh, PhD students. Mm -hmm. uh, Chelsea works with me at American University. Janine's at, at Leiden in the Netherlands. And we were able to identify, you know, a few dozen jihadis and who had gone on to join multiple groups. In some cases, they'd become foreign fighters in six different groups. And we tend to think of, of people who join ISIS as not having very good outcomes. They end up, foreign fighters historically end up being used as cannon fodder, you know, especially Westerners, I suppose, who join jihadi groups. They're not trusted. But the ones who manage to survive end up rising in the ranks to become mm -hmm. even se senior leadership mm -hmm. of different groups. And we found in a few specific cases that they were the ones who transmitted knowledge and expertise. Mm -hmm. They developed best practices. They developed manuals or they went in person and or they became you know, the leaders of major terror plots against Western countries. And so by having these people stay out there, the problem doesn't go away. They probably are more likely to commit mass casualty attacks either at home or somewhere else where, where troops are serving in the future. So given what happens with, with the ones who don't return versus the ones who do, which, you know, even the most, um, th there've been some studies that, that came out, Thomas Hegghammer's work from, from 2013 saying as, as many as basically 10% of returnees. Right. One in nine, he says, yeah. yeah. But, but as he acknowledged at the time, that was sort of selecting on the ones we could see. And his more recent work puts it, you know, more, more like, you know, 1%, something like that, which mm -hmm. still sounds like a lot, but, but we're talking about, you know, the, we're talking about um, dozens you know, of people, not, not thousands, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Hegghammer data from 2013 was, you know, the lethal attacks, which were more likely, as, as he found were significantly more likely, was still like 30 guys across the entire, or, or, you know, a dozen guys across the entire Western world over 30 years. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't try to sell somebody on having that person live next door to them. Mm -hmm. But when we're looking at weighing risks, um, the fact that most returnees, a study I did a couple, that came out a couple of years ago, and returnees found that, Basically, nearly all of them, if they're going to do something, it's within the first six months. Otherwise, they do not commit attacks after that. So if you can identify people, devote resources, in some cases, I think you could you could offer people who are saying, hey, I made a big mistake joining ISIS, please let me back. If you give them the opportunity to become assets, right? If you, if you not just get intelligence from them, but if you also send them out there to be those credible voices about, hey, I went there, this is what it's really like, don't listen to the propaganda. Same way we send people who are convicted of, you know, drunk driving homicides and into mm -hmm. schools to talk about what mm -hmm. they did. Mm -hmm. um, if you're able to get people to do that, they would be probably more credible than any public service announcement that the government could create.
You raise some really interesting points. Uh, I, I understand where you're going with this, and you do have the data to support it. Not surprisingly, I, I would be uh, in slight disagreement on a couple of issues. One is that you know, just saying bring them home and, and watch them, unfortunately, means uh, a resource commit by, by your security intelligence and law enforcement agencies, which are already working at the maximum. Secondly, the whole prosecution, prosecution issue is, is, as I'm sure you understand, very difficult gathering uh, information that would serve an evidentiary standard in a Western court. And this is one of the problems why some of these cases have failed is that I, I, either A, it's intelligence, or B, simply you don't have people who are willing to go to court as witnesses and to provide information against these people. But you're right. I think the data does show that the vast, vast, vast majority of the people do not go on to commit attacks. And I, I've been acknowledging that for years. The problem is, and again, to bring it back to the sort of security intelligence world that I come from, is there's two things. First of all, you're only as good as your last failure, which means if you do get an attack by someone, people don't care about all the successes. They only care about the failures. Uh, and secondly, and you, and you alluded to this, David, this is, this, is a, a, this is an impossible thing to sell to our publics. Our publics don't want anything to do with these people, right? You made your choice. You made your bed. You're going to lie in it. So no government will go to the wall for, for jihadis coming back because there's no constituency that's sort of, uh, you know, um, campaigning for this thing to happen. And therefore, I think we're stuck in a position where perhaps the best policy, and I, and I think I'm leaning slightly towards your position, if the best policy is indeed to bring them back and either A, try them, B, rehabilitate them, although I have no idea what that term means, rehabilitate, or C, uh, use them either overtly in public sort of information campaigns or covertly as sources to infiltrate other terrorist cells. I, I, you know, I'm certainly in favor of that. Do, these, are, these are problems for our publics to understand in 2020. And I just don't see uh, there, any advantage for any politician. I mean, could you imagine Donald Trump standing up at the Republican convention and say, we're going to bring back all the American jihadis because we want to. So I think this problem is one that's going to sort of continue to evolve as, as the years to come. For the record, I, I'm not in favor of a position like the United Kingdom, which revoked uh, Shimiba Begun's uh, citizenship when she only had one. I've categorically stated this is wrong. But on the other hand, what about, do we not owe the countries where these people are being held the right to try them, given their crimes were committed on their soil? At, knowing that, you know, they use torture and then they, and they engage in, in, in capital punishment. What about the argument that they should have their day in court where the, the uh, where their crimes were committed? Oh, these are really great points. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned Trump and, and Shreem Begum. Um, you know, the Trump administration actually admonished European countries to take back all of their citizens from the ISIS camps, including Shemim That's Begum. true. I remember that. That's true. But they also found legal loopholes to keep out an American woman, Hoda Madonna, <laughs> who's pretty similar to Shemim Begum. Yeah. I said, yeah, but her father was a diplomat. So even though she was born in the U.S., that doesn't count. Um, so this is, you know, what every country does, right? They say, yes, my neighbor should be responsible. But, you know, Australia does this too. They, they say, well, this guy's... Uh, Neil Prakash's father was Fijian, so technically yes, he's Fijian, yes. even though he's never been there. Yeah. Um, so everybody does this, right? Not in my backyard. Uh, the, the issue, though, is, is it's double hypocrisy because under international law, every country is required to repatriate and prosecute its own citizens. And this is international law that was created, uh, led by the U.S., specifically in response to ISIS. Back in, you know, in 2014, U.N. Security Council Resolution 2178 binds every country in the world to stop its citizens from going, but also to prosecute them, to take them back. It's, it's left up to individual countries what, under their laws, they're going to do. But we're required to look out for our own citizens. Everybody is, right? Well, let, and, let, let, me, let me just, sorry, David, let, let, me, let me interject here. Is, is the resolution that should our citizens find their way back, we have an obligation to prosecute them where we can, or do we have to take active measures to go and get them in the countries where they're currently located? Well, that's left vague too, right? There, there are a couple of different Security Council resolutions and, and different countries in Europe have had approaches that if you can make your way back, uh, we'll take you, but we're not going to expend resources to get right. you other countries. That's Canada's you know, vision, by the way. Yeah. 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 So, and, and, you know, the U.S. doesn't really have a set view on how to prosecute anybody. But so, in fact, what the U.S. does, um, you mentioned evidentiary standards, which have been an issue. Um, and this was actually, I, would, I did some work with the U.S. State Department in Indonesia when they were trying to bring the Indonesians into compliance with 2178. And they made the same arguments uh, the first time we were out there about evidentiary standards. We can't prosecute people for what they did, might have done in Syria. And you know, who knows if this was really them. That seemed to have changed you know, a year later. And I'm not sure you, know, you can speculate as to what, what pressures might have been brought to bear mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to make that change. But, but countries are supposed to bring their inter domestic laws into compliance with, with international law on this. Right. Um, okay. 
you know, as far as evidentiary standards go, and there have been people prosecute, successfully convicted in Europe for crimes committed in Syria uh, because they were recordings of them bragging about it. But you've had other cases where their lawyers have been more successful in saying, well, how do we know that was really him tweeting about right. that? You know, fake um, video, you have, fake account, whatever. Yeah, right, right. Uh, the you know the U.S. has this this lovely you know charge that the sort of the Al Capone strategy of we, we can't get them for the big things mm. so we'll get them for something small so the U.S. has this this charge of you know material support for terrorism so we actually here never really prosecute anybody for being a foreign fighter even though that's against the law uh, we prosecute them for giving money or, or even just showing up and giving propaganda value or you know in the case of some women cooking a meal you know for your husband that that counts as material support you're getting charged for that. Uh, one of the, you know, the, the potential drawbacks, of course, is that you have shorter prison sentences. So there's been a lot of worrying that in Europe, people are going to be starting to be released now from being convicted a few years ago. Right. Uh, I'll point out that the the data I had on returnees showed that because most people were committing attacks within a few months of coming home, prison didn't really play an issue. There weren't cases of somebody being locked away for several years and then coming out and conducting a terrorist attack after having been a returnee locked away for several years. We've, we, that might change now in the ISIS era. But we've never seen that happen before. So that might be a, some cause for hope. And the other thing, I suppose, uh, on the flip side of that is where they're being detained now. You, know, you have thousands of people in these camps, and they're not secure. Do we expect Kurdish rebels to hold Canadians for, for decades? Exactly. We've seen exactly. cases of, of you know, British uh, subjects and others who've already escaped, and now nobody knows where they are. So the idea of just saying, all right, we're going to leave them out there. Somebody will take care of them seems really short-sighted to me. I, I don't disagree. I think that most of us recognize that the current policy or rather lack of policy is simply untenable. We can't let this uh, simmer forever for all the reasons you said. First of all, uh, a lot of kids are, are, are suffering malnutrition, they're suffering abuse, et cetera, et cetera. I've always argued somewhat unpopularly that at a minimum we should repatriate the children, uh, which means taking them away from their parents. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you're the child of a of a mom or dad who decided to join the ISIS is a good idea that 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 makes you an unfit parent under Canadian law. We, we take away kids for all kinds of reasons, psychological, physical, sexual abuse. This to me is no different. Right. Uh, but I, 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 I think that we're going to be faced with this issue for quite some time. So uh, moving sort of aside from the foreign fighter problem, what else are you, are you looking at? If you want to share with my listeners some current research you're involved in, is it along the same pathway or are you doing some other things at the same time? Um, I'm still doing some work on foreign fighters. It, it, it's one of those godfather things. Every time I think I'm out, they, they drag me back in. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's always some question that comes up, which, which is, you know, there's always something interesting happening. I'm doing some work right now because concerns are emerging for other people about non-jihadis. So there's concern about extreme, you know, white supremacists and others who've gone to Ukraine. Uh, there's some who, returnees from Ukraine who've been involved in homicides in, in the U.S. So there's a, a concern about those networks. Um, so I, I've done a little bit of work on that. I've had a chance to do a, a couple of projects I've gotten started with on people who went to fight against ISIS and the YPG. And, you know, we're, we're doing some interviews uh, with, with some foreign fighters for YPG, including some Canadians uh, mm -hmm. about, you know, why did you, why did you go? What did you do? What are your experiences? Um, so we're hoping to publish those studies soon. Uh, I've done some work in, in, in the COVID era. Uh, I've gotten back to some of my research on, on bioterrorism and biosecurity. That was actually my second book was on, uh, you know, biotechnology and international security, looking at very real Captain America type programs that are being used, uh, developed by, by China, by the US and others, and what, what those would mean. And also homeland security, biosecurity issues. Uh, I'm involved in a project I'm starting up with uh, Cynthia Miller Idris, who's also at American University, looking at responses by ex anti-government extremists to COVID and disinformation campaigns, and, oh. and whether you'd be able to reach people about public safety issues. And also if that, if that might mean you can reach them about some of the anti-government extreme issues too, depending on the, on the information uh, that's provided to them. And I'm, I'm also interested in sort of my next big thing, I suppose, for me, I'm starting work on a project on looking at, at CVE programs, PVE programs, and how we assess them. Um, a lot of programs are contracted out in, in different countries and, you know, there isn't really a sense of, how you measure success for them, not just in terms of outcomes, but how the programs themselves would know if they're reaching somebody. Uh, I think there's a lot of work that can be done in that area, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in that. Well, I, I have to thank you for that last one. I, as someone who worked in CVE, albeit through the security service, uh, I, I, my heart goes out to the people who are trying to do this, but I concur with you 100% that we have no idea really what works, why it works, 
whether we can do it better. The evaluation and metrics of what we're trying to do is, is woefully inadequate in this regard. And as a result, you mentioned the Kanishka project earlier. So for those of us who don't know, Kanishka is a Governor of Canada project that's been around for quite some time, which basically sends research money out both to academics and practitioners to, to look at sort of how do you counter violent extremism and terrorism. And uh, there simply is no good rubric out there for determining what is working and, and what is not. And as a result, money may, may be in fact being spent in directions that is not all useful. In fact, I know for a fact that when you work for the government and, and you, you make money available, the number of hands that go up saying, pick me, pick me, seems to multiply on a daily basis. So I, I look very, very forward to your research on that. It, so it certainly sounds to me that, you know, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, you're, you're actually uh, almost as busy as you can be uh, as an academic. Um, I was doing a lot of work from home anyway before the pandemic hit. I'm now teaching on Zoom, like everybody's living their lives on Zoom. And uh, yeah, the work goes on. Listen, David, this has been a fascinating conversation. I do want to thank you for taking the time. I did know you were half Canadian, which is or, or quarter Canadian, however you want to you want to you want to quote that. But uh, your research is really, really good. I'm going to uh, put links to some of your research on the podcast. So thank you very much for taking the time <clears throat> out of what is obviously a very busy life for you, both in academics and with, and with, with your family. And, and I wish you all the best going forward. Uh, thanks, Phil. Really enjoyed talking with you. So that was my conversation with David Mallet on the whole issue of foreign fighters. Let me know what you think. Do you think we should repatriate? Do you think this is a big problem? You can reach me on email, borealisrisk at gmail.com or on Twitter at Borealis Saves. You'll also find me on LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you like this content, want to subscribe, please go to my website, www.borealisthreatrisk.com. Hit the subscribe button, give me your email. You get a daily digest free of charge, all the blogs, all the podcasts, etc. Love to hear your feedback as well as ideas for future podcasts. I'll talk to you again. Stay safe.